If you want to talk to one of Canada's most decorated Paralympians, Mark Renz, the Canmore Nordic Centre is the place to be. Unfortunately, it's just a little rough on the eyes. Thank you so much for taking the time. I have admitted that if I was not a long track speed skater, my parents were going to put me in biathlon. So it's nice to talk with like the, the goat. <laughs> well, actually, funny thing, my parents actually were debating to go east or west when they immigrated from Holland to, and I'm sure if I would have been here, it would have been, I would have been a speed skater. We would you know? have been flip flopped. Yeah. God, biathlon's like the most interesting, it is one of the most interesting sports. I think so. This is a blunt way to ask it, but how have you kept hungry? I mean, you've won so much through your, throughout your formidable career. Eight Paralympic medals, flag bearer in Pyeongchang. Like, how do you keep hungry? Well, I think that's the beauty of biathlon. There is always more to be had. Um, I kind of said I was always chasing that perfect race, and there's always those little elements that I am. Whether, you know, sometimes I'm skiing well, but I could be skiing faster, or mm -hmm. I could be shooting well, but I could be shooting faster or better. And so I think those elements really help in, for me to keep hungry. You know, what's the limit I can push in the shooting? How fast can I go with shooting or and before, you know, missing? Because misses just, I can't afford misses. Yeah. Um, and so it's like finding that limit of how far can I do it without breathing? is my next question. <laughs> um, but, and then on the skiing, it's a whole another list of questions. You know, can I be faster here? Can I, um, can I train harder? Can I peak um, higher with cer at certain events? Things like that. So for me, biathlon has always been that perfect balance of trying to find where could I push a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And because of the two sports, I guess there's just more volume of places to improve. Are you a better shooter or a better skier? Better shooter. Or is that a silly question? Like, I, uh, you probably get that yes. a lot. <laughs> so it's, uh, there are days where both, you know, one or the other is uh, stronger. Um, in general, over a career, I've always been a stronger s shooter. Mm. Um, and not as strong skiing. So the shooting has always usually kept me in uh, a lot of the races. But now the skiing is starting to catch up as well. And so I'm, yeah, depending on the race. Were you good at duck hunt? No, I never played. Oh, come on. I never shot until I started shooting uh, biathlon. I just went ski shooting with my folks because they have a, a farm in Saskatchewan and I was brutal. I hit, I hit one of the clay pigeons one time. And I was thinking about you. I was like, my God, I wouldn't be good at biathlon. Well, yeah, we, so we just, it's repetition. For us, it's always repetition. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we're doing thousands and thousands of rounds in a, a year. Um, and we're always working at trying to with work within our what we're doing. So when we're coming in, we're not necessarily holding our breath or hold, trying to calm our heart rate as quickly as possible. We're trying to work within that because mm -hmm. we can't wait for our heart rates to come down. So we, a lot of the practice, especially now that we're on snow, we can actually really dial this in, is actually come in the way we want to come in in competition and lay down and we're, everything's just going crazy, but we have to find that nice little pathway that calm pathway in there somewhere that allows us to be both focused and kind of blocking everything out and so we're just focused on trying to get what we need those process those steps that we need in order to shoot well so how do you train for biathlon i mean it's like raw brute power mm -hmm. and then so much finesse yeah. like how, how do you do that <laughs> you just visualize like I'm so interested in that I, I think it's I love that challenge it's yeah. those mixing those two things like the yeah like you said the brute power of skiing the all-out effort and then being able to for me it's I hit this marker and I switch and it's like okay I'm a shooter now and I even say it in my head I'm a shooter now mm. and for me that um, just starts a chain reaction okay i'm looking at the wind flags i'm looking at the people in front of me if they're going to move out of, in and out of the range because that could be chaotic yeah um i'm looking at the sun i'm looking okay how do i feel a quick little check okay i feel like i'm really pushing it so i maybe i need to take that extra breath when i lay down find my rifle lay down you go through that process and all the time i'm kind of think or subconsciously almost like okay going through that checklist 
And unless there is something that comes out of it and be like, oh no, that doesn't feel right, okay, now adjust. Um, and then get into position and that calm. And um, I really love that feeling of that transition and then being able to, everything comes together for that one shot. And, and yeah, you're balancing on the smallest, mis smallest mistake could mean a miss or mm -hmm. uh, the difference between a miss and a hit. And that could be your race as well, right off the bat. Um, and I know I've, I struggled with that a few years ago where it was, I was afraid to take those miss. I was afraid to miss um, because I knew I needed the hitting, hits were what I needed in order to succeed. And I was so afraid, I was actually slowing my shooting down. I had terrible shooting. And finally it's like, let's try something different. I have to be aggressive. And I found that my best shooting has been when I'm aggressive and, and going for it and not, you know, I'm almost daring myself to hit. You say it's a balance. If you gain like five pounds, does that just affect everything? Not just your skiing, but your shooting? Uh, it depends where it is. If it's in my cheeks, yep, yeah, for sure. Um, no, and, and there's, always, there's always that change. Actually, the sun, the, the wind, the sun, the humidity, all these little factors will play into it. Um, we've had ranges where, you know, we train in the afternoon. Um, when it's warm and the next morning it's melted so much that you're two or three inches lower and that changes everything. So it's adjusting to those, we want consistency. The best shooters are consistent um, and we want the same thing over and over again. We want the, the rifle to touch our cheek just in the same spot. We want it to feel like it's on the same part of our bone. Um, you should get a Botox uh, <laughs> sponsorship, buddy. Like, Hopefully. I could be your marketing campaign right now. <laughs> Keep it nice and flush. Yeah, nice, nice. You gotta have a night cream for sure. Yeah, and uh, so all these different things will change over time, and um, it's about trying to be repeat the same thing, but in different conditions. Let's back up a few years, go back to Pyeongchang. You had so much success. Yeah. How has life changed since then? Um, it's a lot of change. I think, in a way, now I'm a lot more mature, and I needed to be more mature as an athlete in mm -hmm. order to take the next step after Pyeongchang. The success of Pyeongchang, I think even a week after, it's like, how do you top this? And I yeah. don't, for me, I, my answer actually immediately was, I don't top this. I have to evolve into something different. Um, the circumstances of Pyeongchang just set up the ability to be that successful. And those will never be there again. I and to be at that level, um, I think it's unrealistic to go after that again mm. and to say that that's the goal. And so for me, I have a very similar goal to Pyeongchang and that's when I get to the start line on March 5th, 2022, I'm gonna be at the best I can be. Best prepared, best, uh, you know, I have the best skis, I have the best fitness, and then I throw down in the race and when I cross that finish line, it's essentially I just put my cards on the table and say, Beat them if you can. And I think that's been, that started in Sochi, that kind of mindset, that kind of approach to results or performance there. And I, it was very successful for me in Pyeongchang. And now I want to take that further now into Beijing. And I think that's the best way for me to, I'm not looking to repeat the results. I'm looking to evolve the performance and see what happens after that. Was the success and all the results cracked up to what you thought it would be? I still can't believe uh, <laughs> those <laughs> results. Um, there were day, yeah, and, and what was neat was it was results and performance from all over. Like I had bad resi results and still was able to, um, the sprint comes to mind. That was a terrible tactical race for me. I made so many mistakes and even in the final 200 meters I made so many mistakes that I'm very upset with even mm. still and I'm working on those mistakes but I think that kind of ingrained um, to work on those things and that's kind of the lesson I learned from those sprints and you know luckily I'm 6'3 and was able to lunge <laughs> for the line for that uh, a, a bronze um, and I think between all six races there were just days where I I woke up and knew today was going to be uh, 
a medal winning performance and other days where it's like okay well you got to make sure the steps are right or this is not going to be great um, and it was really interesting there were races that were s really well done like the gold and uh, in the long distance in the biathlon um, and other races where I didn't feel as good but pushed through find it found a different angle to work on found a different you know tactic on a little on a hill or focused on technique and those led me to the success. So you were seven, correct, when you mm -hmm. lost your arm. Yeah. You have been candid and you said having to relearn, you know, everything that people with two arms do so naturally, all those challenges mm -hmm. set you up perfectly for biathlon. What do you mean by that? Well, I think, uh, and I think it's all sport actually. Um, going through losing my arm at seven, um, the doctors were, it was kind of a strange comment from them, but it was, uh, they said it was kind of the perfect age. Um, I was old enough to realize what had happened and mm -hmm. understand that, but also young enough to kind of adapt. And there were challenges that took much longer to adapt and things I just skip altogether. Monkey bars, don't even start. <laughs> um, but I think it's learning those little um, things, learning to deal with everyday challenges. Um, you know, how do you cut a bun with a knife? Yeah. Um, cutting slices of tomato, things like that. So those were all little, and you know, there's a handful. Tying my shoes was one of the hard ones. Um, and it wasn't until I saw this girl in a pretty pink dress that I um, like, okay, she can do it with one hand. I, I can do it with one hand too. So, <laughs> um, and it's, as part of an athlete, it's something we do, you know, two, three times a day on tying my shoes. So um, there's all these little challenges I think helped um, get me practiced for lack of better word at dealing with challenges right away which is something that we all as athletes experience um, we have these little challenges um, sometimes it's the challenge of just getting better uh, you know trying to get that new pp uh, a new record whatever it may be or just getting something right technically um, and we have these little challenges and i think growing up and and having to learn all these new little things um, made me aware and and yeah I was able to just kind of take that first-hand experience and bring it to uh, sport and still do. You have said that sport is like therapy for you and that it satiates a hunger. Mm -hmm. What are you hungry for? Just constantly improving. I want to see not necessarily just see what my limits are but see how far I can push those. Um, and, and that's the physical limits of trying to push the mental limits of, you know, can, if everything is going wrong and nothing is going right, can I still be able to, you know, turn on the switch and be like, okay, this is a good performance and not let, um, outside things bother me. Um, those are the limits I really want to push. And I, I'm curious to see how far I can go. Do you not get scared of the pain though? Like I would get, oh my gosh, I'd have to do a 1500 meter or something that was too long. <laughs> and I'd be so scared, like it hurts. I can only imagine. Um, I think that's, there are days, yeah, absolutely. Where it's like, okay, this is not gonna be fun. <laughs> it's not gonna be, it's gonna be scary. Um, uh, and I'm not looking forward to it, but it's also, okay, maybe that's a day where something else happens. Um, I know, some tr days I'm looking out the window and it's like, huh, that's a foot of fresh snow there and it's still snowing. And I remember... <laughs> I can't imagine that's not the most fun to ski in. <laughs> it is. And in the end, it's like, okay, well, I have to go and do this workout and it's going to be up to my knees. Yeah. Um, and I remember a couple of those workouts, one in New Zealand in particular, it was an afternoon workout. The hill is, the, the place where we're skiing is closed because no one can get to it. Uh, we're just staying right at the site so we could just go out the door and, and go and opening the door was tough enough <laughs> with that much snow and I remember it was an hour long giggle. I just, just giggled laugh. and had so much fun <laughs> in these impossible conditions like I'm making track no one else is out there I can't see a thing and I'm just giggling at how foolish I am to be out there but it was so much fun and I've had a couple of days like that um, and I think Another one is just the adventures we I can have, um, whether it's a run or a bike or skis, you know, in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of these mountains. 
Um, and it's like, okay, I need to get myself back too because no one's going to find me if I don't. You have loved uh, the challenge of winning and you win a lot. Again, congratulations. But you've always been candid with looking for more meaning via sport. What, what do you mean by meaning? Well, yeah, so the part of sport being therapeutic, I believe wholeheartedly in the power of sport. Um, when I lost my arm and I, a lot of things, you know, I could have just been like, okay, well, that's it. Um, but for me, I, I, I guess being young, I'm just foolish enough to just keep doing everything else, what I was doing, um, whether that was helping my parents on the farm. Um, but sport was really somewhere where I could show others um, rather uh, on my ability rather than my disability. Um, I don't need two arms to cross country run. Uh, and so I, and I had the body type for it and, and the desire to run. And so that was kind of the big one that I really pushed as a kid going out to school was pushing that, you know, can I run? I can run and I can jump. I can't jump that high, but, um, <laughs> and then the next thing was, okay, I can use this to my benefit. My arm is stronger than most people's one arm. So then I kind of got into some throwing events. Then I realized I was way too skinny for throwing events, the good ones. Um, <laughs> And so it was just all these different sports allowed me to show other people I could still do whatever, even with one hand. And I think that was that was the therapeutic side of it. Um, and that's now it's evolved into the success through my actions. You know, I know how to train. I want to commit myself to that training. Um, I want to do the things right. You know, there are days where I have to go and just think about one simple movement in order to get that right. And I think showing that commitment to others and they see the hard work uh, I can do and, and the progress that I'm getting. You know, I can remember her first time, uh, you know, coming to Kenmore and, and how I was skiing. And now um, there are other people looking at me how I'm skiing just to see if they can copy that because it's, I've worked on that, it's now that efficient. Um, and I want to be an example for others to say, okay, that's, what the best looks like and and push and then I want to later on maybe step in there and be like okay let's push even further. You strike me as someone who loves complexity and a complex challenge. Have you always been that way? Yeah I think yeah. so and I think it, yeah again it comes from uh, you know having to do simple tasks but in a different way and so it's that uh, the analytical side of just trying to figure out okay what what can I do? Mm -hmm. How can I do this? And what is it similar to? Um, yeah, my dentist doesn't approve of some of my methods. <laughs> what, uh, like, uh, spill holding the things with uh, my teeth or uh, wow. I've opened bottles with my teeth. And so my dentist is definitely not happy with me. But <laughs> it happens. Um, you've been so candid with just like the role of sport in your life. And you've said, I couldn't live without sport. Mm -hmm. Without insinuating that you're retiring anytime soon, what do you think you'll do when you hang him up? Uh, I'll be staying in sport. Yeah, I think so. Um, I've always enjoyed, uh, I enjoyed it, and I, I like I said, I, I love the power of sport. Um, and for me, a goal that I haven't even touched yet is trying to make other people better. If I want to, um, whether that's a coach, or going into admin, or or any level of sport I think I want to make the next generation better and I think that um, at that time I think that's how I'm going to measure my success is is the next generation better than I am because um, if they're not I think I, I feel like I'm failing myself and mm. them in my job so or in my role whatever that might be so it's a goal I haven't started to, to working on yet um, or little pieces here and there um, but I'm always I want to know more about sport in general. I want to be quite literally a student of sport. I want to, you know, I, I love speed skating. So I see what they're doing. What are they <laughs> training for? How are they training? Um, how are cyclists training? Yeah. I want to think outside the box and learn from other sports and see what we can bring over. That's um, very cool. And on, you know, how are, how's this country doing something and how is this other country doing something? And I think there's really neat um, lessons to be learned if you're looking for it. Um, well, you certainly have had uh, a very long career, so you've been gifted with perspective. 
What are some of the challenges that you think the Nordic community has in Canada? It's such a large sport in so many other areas of the world. Mm -hmm. And we have had a lot of success, I mean, in particular with, with folks like you, but what are some of the challenges that your sport's facing? Um, you know, there are days where I think that list is quite long, but yeah. I think it's, part of it is awareness. Um, we don't see, uh, we don't see the sport. And in most of Europe and around the world, they see the sport, um, you know, every, on the weekends of throughout the winter. And I think we're missing that. Um, not to sound rude or anything, but we don't need to see highlights of hockey <laughs> you know, four or five times every morning. Let's show more sport. I think um, if we wanted to, you could have four or five hours of different sport and mm -hmm. cheering on. You know, I in Europe, the, uh, the competitions are all set up to match e and go after each other. So it could be the first run of Alpine and then a cross country race, then, uh, you know, a little bit of ski jumping, then it's back to the second run of an Alpine race, then it's biathlon. And that's how it's set up. So you have four hours, you have a whole day if you want to mm -hmm. watch. Um, and we need to, yeah, we need to also bring the sport to um, the larger populations of Canada, uh, whether that's Toronto, Vancouver, uh, Calgary, Edmonton, these big cities, we need to try to get the sport there. and. I think, uh, you know, once success comes, people will be attracted to the sport. And once people see the sport, the kids are going to be, you know, I want to do that. That looks fun. I, you know, I want to see other kids take up the challenge of biathlon. Not only one hard sport, but try to do two <laughs> at the same time. <laughs> Pretty hard. It's hard even just watching it. I'm like <gasps> holding my breath while I'm watching it. How much pressure do you put on yourself, though, knowing that you are one of the faces that um, can, you know, get the success? Or get the sport uh, significant exposure? Uh, I, at the moment, I don't think about it. Um, or in the moment, I should say, I don't think about it. I think the, for me, uh, it's my success has always come from the process. Mm -hmm. I need to be, these are the steps I need. I need to, this is what I need to do to be ready and, um, and then do those things in my head. And, Yes, that's sometimes adapting the race plan if I need to, but also, you know, having that plan and executing that plan. March 5th, 2022. How often do you think about that date? Uh, only the last three years. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, it, and for me, it's not e the opening ceremonies are on the 4th. I know that, but I don't need to be ready for the opening ceremonies. I want to be ready for that first race. And that's why it's always been for me, March 5th. Um, that's the day where I need to be ready for, and that's in my head. Those are that's the time that I need to be focused. That's the end of my timeline, and then it's about execution. Um, yeah, it's always been kind of the excitement. I looked it up a couple of weeks after uh, <laughs> Pyeongchang ended. It's like okay, that's the goal because for me, I need that that point, and that's where I want to get to. What time will your race start? Around noon. Isn't that, isn't that <laughs> wild that you can tell someone where you're going to be four years out in advance? What does your uh, days look like from here until Beijing? For me, I think the big one is just making smart de decisions. Um, using every opportunity to get uh, the best what I need, whether that's, okay, I need to work on this element today or I need to do this in this race. Um, it's about, yeah, getting ready and, you know, this is, we're kind of into the fun stuff. This is now it's about uh, the last few weeks, the last few months, yeah. uh, and eventually it'll be the last few days. And it's about having that fun, setting up everything. Um, I know I've done the work and it's now just pretty much putting the icing on the cake. Will you shave your beard? I'm I don't know. I'm st aerodynamics, I'm thinking, buddy. I, I'm thinking about it, but I'm not sure yet. Do, would that actually like have an effect? It drives me crazy when I see uh, speed skaters with the beard. I'm like, what? Yeah, like, shave it. Full suit <laughs> yeah. and then beard. Uh, I don't know. Um, I haven't raced the games with, but uh, no, it's it started with the pandemic. I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. I thought about it, like, do what's what am I going to do with it? But not sure yet. Well, that might be just the little millimeter. Yeah. Your Point nice seven metal. of a second. Yeah, yeah. I appreciate you taking the time so much. It's lovely to see you. We, of yes. course, we would be pumping iron together about a decade ago. So it's, it's yeah. funny how this is full circle. I really appreciate your time, Mark. Thank you for having me.